In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The New Living Translation translates these words, God blesses the peacemakers. God blesses the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. The history of humanity is one of conflict and violence. Beginning with Cain and Abel, brothers are in conflict with each other. All through the scripture, all through human history, we know that there is conflict. You and I live in this present age. There is conflict among our families, conflict among neighbors, conflict among various ethnic groups, con conflict among various tribes, various nations. We live in a time of conflict. And I want to say that our time is no different from any other time. There has never, there has never been an age on the earth when humanity lived in peace. Since the fall, there has never been an absence of conflict. The Apostle Paul, when he's talking about the nature of humanity in Romans chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, quotes the prophets. Speaking of you and me, speaking of our kinfolk, speaking of our neighbors and other humans across the world, all of us, Paul says that our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. The path of peace they have not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Like it or not, Paul's talking about us. He's talking about humanity as a race. Humanity as fallen from the glory and the image of God. And it is a context of conflict that Jesus utters these words. Blessed are the peacemakers. Because the, as he is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, Rome is occupying Palestine. As he is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, the people hearing his words are remembering violence perpetrated against them by Roman soldiers. And the crowd that Jesus is preaching to are zealots, guerrilla warriors. To the Romans, they're terrorists. They're opposing the Roman state. But to the Jews in Palestine, they're patriots, and they're fighting in the spirit of the Maccabees, and they want to liberate the Holy Land from Roman oppression. And they hear these words of Jesus, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God, and they get disenchanted with Jesus. They're there because they're expecting Jesus to be the Messiah, and they're wanting to hear something from Him that affirms their hatred of Rome and affirms their violent actions. But as they are looking for excuses to commit warfare against Rome, they hear the Messiah say, Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Now before I get too much further into this message, I want to say this. Peaceful reconciliation is not always possible. It is desirable. It is what we're called to do. We're called to give our lives for the sake of reconciling humanity to God. But in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, Do not think that, I came, think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Jesus becomes the point of conflict. And he becomes the point of conflict to the point that he lays his life down on a cross so that all humanity can be reconciled to God. So we're in this age of conflict. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. James, the Lord's brother, asked the question in James chapter 4, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your pleasures? 
that wage war in your members. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You, do, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. James is getting to the heart of the, of the issue of conflict in humanity, whether it was Cain and Abel or Jacob and Esau later, or the conflict between James and John and the rest of the disciples, the conflict between Jesus and Rome, between some of us in this building today, some of us who are sitting next to our spouses, we're in conflict with one another, we're in conflict with our children, some pastors are in conflict with other pastors. What is the source? James wants us to understand the source is our desire to have everything we want the way we want it. The source of our conflict is to have everything we want the way we want it. Let me introduce you to a truth. As long as you live on this planet, in this present age, you're not going to have everything you want, and especially when and the way you want it. That is a mark of narcissism and selfishness. That is not who, are we, who we are called to be. We are called to live our lives in self-sacrifice and in self-denial for the sake of peace and reconciliation. The way of peace is not the avoidance of conflict, but engaging conflict. Some people are just wonderful at avoiding. The problem with avoidance is it allows conflict to brew. And at some point in time, it's going to, bo it's going to bubble over the pot. To avoid conflict is to prolong conflict. Now, we must engage conflict, whether it's conflict in our marriage, in our family, in our home, conflict in our church, conflict in the world. We must engage it and engage it righteously with the desire to reconcile all the parties. So when Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, we need to understand what he's saying. The sword that Jesus speaks of must be understood as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So it is the words of God that are spoken, the words of God that are proclaimed, the words of God that are obeyed, that are the source of res resolving our conflict. There are three levels of conflict that I want to talk about this morning that Jesus speaks about. Now all of these kind of flow into one another, they overlap. But all through the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus talks about conflict. And there are three different types, three different levels of conflict that He mentions. So that's what I want to deal with this morning. First, in Matthew chapter 5 verse 24, Jesus said, Be reconciled to your brother. Be reconciled to your brother. He says in Matthew 5 23, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present the offering. Now you've heard me say this before. We tend to think that our relationship with God is just that. It's between me and Jesus. It's between me and God not according to Jesus. Jesus says that if we have conflict with one another that we are obligated to resolve that conflict before we come to offer our worship at the temple. That's why the Apostle Paul says that we should not let the sun go down in our wrath or go down in our anger. We need to engage these things. We need to resolve these things and resolve these things quickly. But when we're talking about brother, when Jesus says be reconciled to your brother, there are various ways that we can understand this. First, literally within the family. Sibling, sibling conflict, very common. So when we're talking about being reconciled to a brother, we can talk about siblings within a family, or it can be friends or fellow believers. Be reconciled to family, friends, and, fa and fellow believers. Now this is what we've got to understand. Reconciliation requires self-denial, giving preference. If you've got to have everything your way, you're never going to resolve conflict in your life. 
Because it doesn't matter how much you love your spouse, how much you love your brother, how much you love your parents, how much you love your friends, there are going to be times that you're going to disagree on issues. There are going to be times that you're going to disagree on all sorts of things. Immature people who have got to have everything their way are going to provoke more conflict. They're going to pitch fits. Listen, it is proper to expect equality, but not domination. Being a peacemaker means understanding that I have no right to dominate my wife, even my children. I have no right to dominate my friends, my family. That as a peacemaker, I am called to walk equally before them and allow them to walk equally before me. Just as I am concerned about my own conduct, my own rights, my own treatment, I am to be more concerned with how I treat people around me. I used to tell my sons all the time when I was raising them and they would come home and talk about something that happened at school and they would say, Daddy, it's just not fair. And over and over and over again I told my boys, I'm not concerned with how other people treat you. I'm concerned with how you treat them. That's maturity. That's peacemaking. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul calls us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. This is what we're called to do, be peacemakers. And this is how we do it. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance. We've got to understand that other people don't have to live their lives simply to please me. We've got to understand that other people don't get up in the morning thinking that Dan Tomberlin is the center of the universe. And therefore, the best thing Dan Tomberlin can do when he gets up in the morning is to make a choice to tolerate people around me. There are some people that when you get around, you know this, there are some people we just enjoy. For whatever reason, we just enjoy them. We share common interests and share common goals, and for you know, we share common mute. We enjoy, we enjoy getting around together. There are some people, however, that we don't necessarily enjoy, but it doesn't mean that we must be in conflict with them, and it doesn't mean that we must avoid them. It means that we must learn to tolerate them with humility. And patience. And I want to remind you what that word patience means. The King James Version translates that word as long suffering. In other words, patience means I am making a choice to suffer a long time with this individual, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What are we called to do? Preserve the unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. And because that is my call to be a peacemaker, then I am going to show tolerance in love. Now I can hear some of you right now saying, but pastor, doesn't the scripture say, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? It does. This is the only thing I have to agree with to walk with you in unity, that I love you and you love me. That's it. I don't have to agree with your political positions. I don't have to agree with all your theological positions. I don't have to agree with much of anything with you to walk with you in unity if I choose first to love you and you choose to love me. And that's the greatest call of all. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you do what? Love one another. Everybody say that with me, love one another. Say it together, love one another. That's what we're called to do. And if we're going to love one another, then we're going to show tolerance with one another, and we're going to live in, hu in humility, and we're going to suffer long with one another. Let's break this down where it gets even more personal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul is talking about marriages. 
He says, to the married I give instruction, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. So that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Apparently in the Corinthian church, many of the believers decided, well, you haven't converted to Christ. You're not living for Christ. So my call to Christ means I can no longer be married to you. Paul says no. You don't have to share the same religious convictions to live together. You don't have to agree about everything. All you have to do is agree to love one another. Be reconciled. This is what we have to do. James says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins. The word confession simply means to tell the truth about yourself. And buddy, we don't like to do it. That's why when we go to the store to buy clothes, we always go first to the clothes that are too tight on us. Because we don't want to admit we've gained 10 pounds. That's why... And if you do this, I'm just doing this for the sake of illustration. I'm not saying it's a sin. But that's why some of us men, when we hit our 50s and 60s, we start buying things we've never bought before, like black hair dye. Now, we know the women don't do such as that. But we're, we live in denial. We live in denial of all sorts of things. And one of the things that we live in the most denial about is our own sinfulness. It's very easy to look at the splinter in each other's eye and ignore the log in our own. We do it all the time. But if we're going to work for reconciliation, the first thing we've got to do is be willing to confess our sins to one another, pray for one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, and then you may be healed. And when, he, when James is using that word, you may be healed, he's not simply talking about physical healing. He's talking about soul healing. He's talking about deliverance. He's talking about resolving the conflict. He's talking about bringing people together and healing that rift. We have this wonderful story in Genesis of these two brothers, Jacob and Esau, even when they're born, they're in conflict with one another. They're wrestling within their mother's womb. And Esau was born first, but Jacob is a deceiver. And at some point in their lives, Jacob deceives his father and deceives his brother and steals his brother's birthright. And this becomes such a conflict within the family that their mother sends Jacob off lest Esau murder Jacob. And they're separated for years. But then there comes the time that they're meeting one another again. And Jacob knows that he's got to make things right with Esau. So he sends gifts and sacrifices along the way. But finally that moment comes when Jacob and Esau are face to face. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked and behold Esau was coming. He himself passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times. He showed deference to his brother. Until he came near to his brother, then Esau, listen to this, ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. That's what reconciliation looks like. Reconciliation is putting behind you decades of conflict, decades of wrath, decades of anger. And in your eagerness to embrace one another, our hearts are broken and our arms are open wide. And as we open our arms wide, we are surrendering all of that history of pain so that we can embrace our brother, our friend, one more time. Be reconciled to your brother. The second level of conflict that Jesus deals with he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, make friends quickly 
with your opponent. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. That word opponent can also be translated adversary. Now sadly sometimes brothers, friends, family members become opponents, adversaries. An opponent is one who stands against one who causes or imposes hardship and affliction in your life. This can refer to economics, politics, and religion. Now listen to me. I don't think, I've read a lot of American history. You know, you watch the news and you watch the talking heads and they will tell you that modern American politics have descended to the lowest level in history. These people have not read a history book. American politics is full of conflict. The, once, the, uh, the people who at one time revered George Washington during his presidency despised George Washington. And I could just go on and on and on, but this is what I want to say to you. You and I need to understand that we are called to be different. And we do not need to engage in the language of adversarial politics if we want to be children, men and women, who are peacemakers, who are the sons and daughters of God, who are called to the ministry of reconciliation. Make friends quickly with your opponent. Reconciliation requires negotiation. Reconciliation requires negotiation. The willingness to talk. The willingness to compromise. The willingness to engage one another. It's proper to be assertive, but not aggressive. It's proper to assert my rights, the rights of my children, the rights of my friends. It's not proper for me to be aggressive against my opponents to deny them their legitimate rights, their justice, their sense of fairness. Jesus makes one of the statements that we have the most trouble with in this sermon. He says, if someone comes to you and strikes you on one side of the cheek, turn the other cheek. And we have interpreted turning the other cheek as surrender, giving the evil person authority over us. But that's not what turning the other cheek is. Turning the other cheek requires standing face to face with my adversary. Turning the other cheek is an act of non violent defiance in the face of injustice. Turning the other cheek is not surrendering. For me to turn the other cheek means I have to look my adversary, my opponent in the eyes and I stand there toe to toe with him and I don't back down with him. Even though I allow him to strike me, I do not back down. This is not surrender. This is engagement. This is putting away wrath, putting away anger, putting away violence. Last year we saw just such an example. We have, again, we have a lot going on in our country and it's put various camps in, in, in conflict and opposition. And if you'll remember a couple of years ago when the gay activists went after Chick-fil-A and you know everybody went and ate Chick-fil-A that day. During all that time, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, Dan Cathy, was doing something remarkable. One of his most vocal, vocal critics was a gay activist by the name of Shane Winmeyer. Kathy called him, invited him to go to a ball game with him, spent the day with him. After several weeks and months of Dan Kathy reaching out to Winmeyer, Winmeyer wrote an article in Huffington Post and he said, I'm coming out as a friend of Dan Kathy. He said, he and I don't agree on politics, and he and I certainly don't agree on gay rights. But I have learned that Dan Cathy is not my enemy, he's my friend. Jesus said, make friends quickly with your opponent. I don't know what provoked it, but 
I saw on Facebook this past week, somebody had quoted T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes supporting President Obama, and this friend of mine posted on Facebook, I'm done with T.D. Jakes. Well, then be done with me. Because I am not going to let politics, I am not going to let economics, I am not going to let race, I'm not going to let anything keep me from loving, praying for, and trying to make friends quickly with my opponents. That's what Jesus has called us to do. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Standing firm, yes, stand firm face to face with our opponent. Stand firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Then he says this, in no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me. This is what we've got to do. We have got to embrace the fact that as long as we preach and teach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can stand firm in the face of our adversaries. And as they're striking our cheek, we extend a right hand of fellowship and friendship. That means suffering for the sake of Christ, but it also means an opportunity to share Christ with our opponents. Paul told Titus in Titus chapter 2 verse 6, Likewise urge the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach so that the opponent will be put to shame. <laughs> Having nothing bad to say about us. That's what happened Dan Caffey treated Shane Windmeyer with so much love and respect, even though they will never agree politically or socially on the issues, Windmeyer came to respect Caffey as a believer. Issues must be resolved so that a just relationship may ensue, and sometimes that means restitution is required, making things right. In Numbers chapter 5, speak to the sons of Israel, when a man or a woman commits any of the sins of mankind acting unfaithfully against the Lord that the person is guilty, then he shall confess his sins, tell the truth, shall confess his sins which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrong, and add to it one Fifth, and give it to him who is wronged. So if you've stolen something that's worth $100, you don't simply give them $100 back, you give them $120. You make it right. If we have injured, if we have stolen, it's not just enough to say, I'm sorry. Let's go back to Jacob and Esau. When they were coming together, Jacob knew that he had defiled Esau of his birthright. So what was Jacob doing? Constantly sending gifts ahead of him to meet Esau. He was acting to make restitution. Things have to be made right. The third level of conflict, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. An enemy is defined as one who hates, one who troubles, one who speaks evil against you, an oppressor, a persecutor, a captor, someone who injures and abuses you. This can be a spouse who is abusive, who sexually is sexually deviant, molests children, no longer is that spouse a legitimate part of the family, but that spouse is an enemy to the well-being of the family. 
It can be someone in the church. John said that even today there are antichrists among you, people who are acting in opposition to the mission of Christ sitting right in the church. And it's certainly true in the world. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is not Phil Robertson, convert them or kill them. This is Jesus, pray for them and bless them. Love them. Reconciliation requires the sacrifice of justice in favor of mercy. If what I want is justice, let me tell you about justice. Justice is harsh. If I'm going to be reconciled, I have to favor mercy over justice. Now listen, it's proper to be cautious when negotiating, when dealing with an enemy. It's proper to be cautious, but it's not proper to be vengeful. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. I am certain that there are Christians in Iraq and Iran and Indonesia and in China who live with that verse every day, who are hated for no other reason than they're Christians. Jesus said at that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. That means our hearts will grow hard and as hearts grow hard, hate, violence, lawlessness will abound. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 the Apostle Paul is talking about a certain man at, at uh, Ephesus named Alexander. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Again, it's right to be cautious when dealing with enemies. Be on the guard. 1 Timothy, Paul is again talking about Alexander. He says in verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Conflict resolution, being peacemakers means engaging, fighting the good fight. Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, listen, whom I have handed over for Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Look how Paul is dealing with conflict within the church. Alexander has vigorously opposed the Christian gospel. He has inflicted problems and, and injured the Apostle Paul. Paul is not vengeful for him, but Paul gives him to the hands of God. And that's exactly how we need to be praying about persecutors and violent people. You and I as peacemakers, we need to realize we may not can be reconciled with them, that this is too big for us, that we don't have the power, we don't have the authority, we don't have the knowledge, we don't know what to do, but that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and we should pray every day for the salvation of those who are persecuted and give the persecutors over to the enemy, put them in the hands of God. Now Jesus, when he says, love your enemies... He's calling His disciples to act with justice towards our enemies. Exodus chapter 23 verse 4, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. Now this is more than livestock. In the ancient world an oxen or a donkey was the economic engine that made the economy turn. That's what they used to transport goods to market. That's what they used to plow and farm with. So to say if you see your neighbor, your enemy's oxen or donkey, that's like saying you see his truck, his work truck or his, or his tractor. In other words, you don't kill the ox, you don't burn the tractor, you send it back to your enemy because that is an act of justice, that is an act of mercy, and that is an act of trying to be reconciled to your enemy. 
And that's something that we have a hard time with because it's our enemy. He shot and killed our ox. We're starving to death. There's his ox. Let's just steal it and take it. No. The law says give it back. Proverbs 24, 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Or the Lord will see it and be displeased and turn his anger away from him. The Apostle Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Now, number one, notice that. Paul recognizes that sometimes there are some people who just want to see the world burn. There are some people that just want to dominate. There are some people who just want to destroy everything around them. They would rather destroy everything around them than share it. Paul says, as far as it's possible, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, he will, you will heap burning coals upon his head. By showing justice and kindness to our enemies, we demonstrate their sinfulness. And we demonstrate the righteousness of Christ. Many of you may not remember this, but in the 1980s, the, one of the major conflicts on the planet was in South Africa. Being play, played out in the person of Nelson Mandela, the African leader who had been in prison 27 years by the white South African government. Nelson Mandela was the leader of the National African Congress, and the National African Congress had allied itself with the Soviet Union, and therefore our government viewed the National African Congress as an enemy organization, and we were supporting the white South African government. But as history began to move forward, it became evident that the white, the minority white government was not going to be able to survive in South Africa. So the South African president began negotiations with Nelson Mandela in prison. And after 27 years, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And at the next national election, Nelson Mandela was elected president of, United, of, the, of South Africa. And many people had said for decades that if the black people ever get power in South Africa, there will be a bloodbath. There will be a race war. And in fact, there had been a race war. There had been a race war. The white government was, was oppressing and kidnapping and imprisoning uh, blacks for political activism. Blacks were turning upon blacks. Those who favored Nelson Mandela were burning and executing blacks who worked with the white government. I mean, it was just ugly and violent for decades. And everyone thought that once Mandela is in power, that it was going to be a bloodbath, but it wasn't. Instead, working with some of the leaders, like Bishop Desmond Tutu, the South African government set up what was known as Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. As if anyone who committed a crime for political or economic reasons in South Africa would simply come before a judge and tell the full story they would be pardoned and free to go home. South African white army officers and police officers lined up, some with tears rolling down their cheeks, others with stony faces told the stories of brutality and persecution and torture and imprisonment. And after they told their stories, they were given a legal pardon and sent home to live in peace. If you will simply tell the truth, we will forgive you. It's possible for enemies to become brothers. Some of the most moving stories that I've ever seen on the news are these stories of these Japanese soldiers and our World War II veterans who will go to Japan or Nagasaki or, or um, Iwo Jima and Soldiers who at one time were fighting to kill each other and would have strangled each other with their bare hands are now decades later embracing one another with tears in their eyes, honoring one another. Reconciliation is possible. Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. 
Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. God blesses those who are peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. We don't need to get caught up in the wrath and the anger of the politicians. We don't need to get caught up in the wrath and the anger of the gay rights and the anti-gay rights folks. What we need to do is stand firm in our faith, stand firm in our convictions, face our antagonizers, face our brothers, face our opponents, face our enemies, tell the truth, and respond in tolerance in patience, suffering long, and love. That's what we're called to do. 